Welcome to The Warehouse. Has the Sunday sermon ever left you running to Google with new theological questions? Have you ever wished you could peer behind the curtain and see how a message comes together? That's where we come in. Here at Cornerstone Church, we spend hours every week talking about Scripture. This is the place to learn about passages, dive into their context, and study the Bible's cultural background. Come to The Warehouse, where we extend what you learn from the stage. Hey guys, welcome back to The Warehouse Podcast. Today it is me and Morgan. What up? So our question for today, because we had Dunkin' Donuts because they just opened up this week. We had them this morning. What is your favorite donut? Hmm. I I like pretty much every donut, not too picky. But if I had to pick a favorite, it'd be like any kind of like cake donut. Cake donut? Yeah. You don't have a top favorite cake though? Um, I I like the blueberry one. I I like one that has like cinnamon on it. Like I don't mm-hmm. really know. I mean, I'm not very picky when it comes to a donut. I think they're all good. Really? Yeah. So one of the things that make me go, eh is like a filled donut. That's fine with me. Really? Yep. Don't care. Jelly? Sure. Okay. It's a donut, man. It's a donut. <laughs> yeah. Just eat it. So like my favorite donut is a chocolate long john, but without filling. And if it has filling in it, I'll eat around the filling and then just throw it away. Hmm. That's weird. It is weird. Yeah. But I would just get a different donut. But whenever people are trying to be kind and they know your favorite donut is a chocolate long john, mm-hmm. and they're trying to be nice, and they bring you on with filling. You don't want to be rude. So I guess. Yeah. I just eat around it. Okay. Or like squeeze out the stuff. Whatever. It okay. grosses me yep. out. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a, this is like the shortest intro we've ever had. Well, I mean, I mean, donuts are donuts. I don't right. know. Right, 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 right. I mean, that makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Well, so now we are on to our next part in the follow series, our next practice Um, We are jumping into guard this month. So guard, as like in a brief description, is how we create healthy habits and rhythms in our lives um, to walk in step with the Spirit. Um, It helps us create healthy boundaries and um, also like engaging in personal accountability. And so, yeah, the importance of like verging and meeting with one another to hold each other accountable and then putting up healthy guardrails in our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited for this. Me too. I like this one a lot. Um, My favorite, though, is invite, I think, just because of the whole, like, difference of, like, inviting somebody along with you to, like, more of less a discipleship model than just inviting somebody to church. But guard, I feel like, is a very important habit to have in our life. Yeah. Yeah, I think I lean toward my favorite. It's probably reflect. I'm I'm very um, contemplative. Like, I like to sit and think. Um. I'm a slow processor sometimes, but just the idea of like reflecting on where I'm at as, Mm -hmm. as a believer and where I'm at on my walk and not just rolling through life and not thinking about it. I mean, cause it can be so easy to get so busy. Right. Um, I think it's so important for us to sit and, and reflect on it. So it's my favorite because I know it's something that I need to do better at. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Man, now I want to kind of change my answer, but that's what I do. So anyways, jumping into um, this week, week one, we are in Daniel 1. Um, so what's your context? My oh, con- no, no. Big idea first. Big yeah, idea. Yeah, come on. Oh, we need yeah, Nathan. I'm failing it. We need Nathan. Okay. My big idea is Daniel and his friends stand firm to God's word despite pressure to conform. Mine is Daniel and the boys remained faithful to God and refused to conform to the world. Can I just tell you that I do not like that you call them the boys? Why? It just throws me off and doesn't feel right. I love it. Okay. That's what I call them because like, no, 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 no. I have to defend this because mostly people it. call them Shadrach, <laughs> Meshach, and Abednego. And it's like, that's not their names. Like that's their Babylonian names. And I can never really remember their Hebrew names. Oh. So it's Daniel okay. and the voice. Yeah. So you're like really adamant about we can't call them their Babylonian names so much so that you don't even remember their real names. I know there's like yeah. Michelle. Yeah, hold on. Hananiah, Azariah. Yeah, you're reading it. I'm so good job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I remember too whenever I look at the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody does. Yeah. It's fine. It's good. Okay. The boys. But it is the boys. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. 
Context. Now it's time for context. Okay. And you're going to go first because oh, you've okay. got the good stuff. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So Daniel's story is set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem. We see that in Second Kings 24. Um, the book of Daniel is likely written between 540 and 530 BC. Um, they had plundered the city and the temple, taking a wave of Israelites into exile. Among them was these four men of royal family in the line of David, Daniel later named Belteshazzar, and his three friends who probably known more by their Babylonian names. So we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but their names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Um, So this book mainly tells their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors. And we have chapters 1 through 6, where it focuses on Daniel and his friends in Babylon. Chapters 7 through 12, where it talks, it contains like Daniel's visions about the future. And just some like really cool things about uh, Daniel is chapter one is written in Hebrew and chapters two through seven were written in Aramaic. And then chapters eight through 12 go back to Hebrew. I just think it's really it cool. neat, like how it's like kind of sectioned up like that. Um, oh, and another fun thing that I like kind of pictured this go around of studying Daniel was how similar Daniel and Joseph were. Um, both of them prospered in a foreign land after interpreting dreams for their rulers, and both of them were elevated to a high office uh, to result in their faithfulness to God. That's good. That is good. Um, did you find anything on why it was written in Aramaic for those chapters? I did a like a brief study. So this is from me like kind of coming like back from memory. So if I get it wrong, please just call me out on it. But part of it was um, because of like the culture there at Mm -hmm. the time. And so to have that written to them as well. And so like Babylonians kind of had Aramaic as their primary language, but I could be wrong. What did you find? Yeah. I mean, I think that's about right. I, I don't know the for sure answer, but the commentaries that I was reading leaned on that <clears throat> that portion was like the special significance behind it and like who it was being written to and really for would have been a non-Hebrew audience mm. and non-Hebrews wouldn't have spoke Hebrew. They would have probably spoke Aramaic. So in in order for them to really get it, he wanted it to be writ or who, you know, they wanted it to be written in that their natural language yeah. Yeah, just so they can get the best understanding for it. Love it. Yeah. Um. A couple of things that I had was you split it up with one through six and then seven through 12. So one through six being the more like biographical part of the book where it's actually talking about Daniel's um, life and mm-hmm. what he was doing, um, you know, after he had been exiled and sent to you know, sent to Babylon, or sorry, um, after he had been sent to Babylon mm-hmm. and taken, and then what what happens after that, and then, you know, just his his inner workings with the king and all that stuff. And then after that, you go through 7 through 12 is mostly visions, mm-hmm. and, and, and it's more of a, um, the way, it, like, it would be called a apocalyptic literature. Um, so it's not, the whole entire book isn't considered apocalyptic literature, but the big chunk of it at the end is. And the meaning behind that is it's like similar to what you would see in Revelation. Um, it's just a, it has all those same themes that you would see in apocalyptic literature because um, it has someone who's receiving truths from God in visions. Mm-hmm. It has um, symbols and signs that are being extensively used. And then it also has this like special um, revelation that's being concerned with like God's uh, plan and his future for like the people of Israel. Um, So all of those things wrapped in there, um, you get to see that 7 through 12 is actually um, not necessarily like following some chronological order or anything. It's just visions and dreams and things that Daniel had. And then they're kind of being just like presented as, hey, here is like what what God has given Daniel to be able to to tell either the king or just to tell about Israel. Mm. Yeah, that's good. All right. Do you have anything else for big context? Um, I don't think so. Big picture wise. No. Nope. Okay. Moving into like more immediate context. So we have in the 
Uh, so we're in chapter one. So in verse one is part of the immediate context. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jeho- Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So, like, this is considered immediate context, but it's also a part of the text that we'll yeah. be studying today. Um, the reason why it's considered immediate context is because it's setting up the stage for verse 3 and on. Um, so, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, so this would have been around 605 B.C., Jehoiakim did wrong in God's eyes. So we see that in 2 Kings 23, 37. And due to Judah's continuous sin, God let Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar, capture and enslave them. Jehoiakim was taken to Babylon in chains. We see that in 2 Kings 24, 1 and 2 Chronicles 36, 6. Um, Daniel and his friends were also taken at the time. And Jehoiakim returned to Jerusalem later, but served as King Nebi's uh, for three years and paid him tribute. <laughs> oh my goodness! The nicknames. Yeah. It's yeah. fine. King Nebi. I love King it. King Nebi. Yeah, it but, works. <laughs> so you do you have a note? So here we have third year reign. But was it in? It's in another. Is it in Jeremiah? Yeah, or Jeremiah. The second year. Yep. Or fourth. Right. I don't know. It's I think it's fourth. Two or four. And it's all just based off of like. Uh, this one is on like a Babylonian counting system mm-hmm. here because, I mean, that's just what Daniel would have been in. Um, and then I'm pretty sure Jeremiah's was just on a different uh, counting system. So it it isn't actually any different. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's, you know, if you look at different commentaries or different theologians, they have all their different reasoning for why it could be different numbers. But um, I think the main point is, is it's not about like the exact year it's just this is telling the story yeah um so less focus on why is this one different Um, right but yeah i think one of the main reasons for that was just different ways that it was counted right not contradicting one another it's just different yeah views yep and then one of the things about verses one and two that i think is so important for like the context of the entire book is within that there's there's like two themes that are presented that run through the entire book of Daniel. And one is Mm -hmm. Babylon versus Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So you see Babylon besieging Judah. And I mean, it's the city of the world versus the city of God. And you see that all throughout, not only the book of Daniel, but I mean, that's through the story of the Bible. Yeah. 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 Yeah, We see it all the way (laughs) until the very end. Yeah. And then the second theme is, and this one is to me, maybe not the most important, but for me, it stuck out the most is, um, that line of the Lord gave Jehoiakim mm-hmm. into his hand. So you get to see this theme of God's sovereignty, mm-hmm. um, that God is, he has authority over everything, over right. kings, over nations, over rulers, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, looking at it, you know, in one view, someone might say, oh, yeah, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar just took him over and, right. uh, you know, just a better king or he, you know, planned it right or whatever it may be. But you see in here, it says the Lord gave mm-hmm. him over. Um, so I just think it's important to note that because as you go through not only the book of Daniel, but just this first chapter, you see countless times of the Lord did, the Lord did, mm-hmm. the Lord did. Yeah, I think isn't there three times where we have the Lord gave, it's Lord gave in verse two, the Lord gave in, or God gave in verse nine, and then God gave in verse 17. Yep. So it's just that constant reminder of like, hey, this is because God's sovereignty. Mm-hmm. This isn't out of his control or spectrum. Yep. yep. Um. So King Nebuchadnezzar, or as I like to call him, King Neb or King Nebi, um, he <laughs> ruled in Babylon from 605 to 562 BC. He's known as the greatest Babylonian king and built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Uh, he's mentioned about 90 times in the Bible mostly in the book of Daniel, where he appears as the main character alongside alongside Daniel um, from chapters one through four. So he was like a great ruler. Yeah. Because um, he is known for just dominating. Yeah. Like what he... Yeah, I think in even like extra biblical texts where you see um, any kind of mention of King Nebuchadnezzar, mm-hmm. I mean, it is always talked about as he was the greatest king that Babylon ever mm-hmm. had. 
It's crazy. Okay. Do you have anything else from verses one through two? No, I do not. The only, uh, I don't have a note on it, but something that just is kind of sticking out. And I think we kind of mentioned it a little bit next to Jesus, but um, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of Mm. the house of God and brought them to the land of Shinar. So how King Neb is taking these uh, things out of the temple and bringing him into his own like temple. Yeah. So it's yep. totally degrading right. our God. Yes. Yeah. In light of his. So. Yeah. And just so there's no confusion, the word Shinar there isn't something different. It's just an ancient name for Babylon. So mm. it can be a little bit confusing of like, okay, so king of Babylon comes in, takes this, brings it here. Why do you take it there? It's just another word for the same exact place. Good point. Yeah. I don't think I got that. Good no. job. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Thank you. All right. You want to read verses three through seven? Uh, yeah, sure. I do. Yes. I just have to pull it up. No, I'm just kidding. It's right here. Okay. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. How far do you want me to read? All the way to seven. Okay. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Hey! Nice. I wanted you to read it because of the names. I got a little nervous whenever I looked down. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I did great. The chief just gonna be eunuch's prideful. name is the one that like yeah. gets me. Yeah. Ashpenaz. Yeah. Did I say it right? I, th- I mean, say it with confidence and it's always right, right? Yes. <laughs> it's the confidence part that's yes. hard for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, verse three kind of setting more of a context. So we have these Boys who are being taken from their family. Um, some commentators that I read said they were about the age of 14. Um, this is a high impressionable time within our youth. Uh, I, I mean, Morgan, you work with students. Oh, you yeah. could agree. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, somebody made a comment next to Jesus. They were like, well, my 14 year old doesn't listen to what I say. And I was like, well, they listen to what the world says. So they yeah. are very impressionable. It just may not be the right people that they're taking the impression from. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, 14 is one of those ages where it's like, man, they're taking everything in. They want to be mm-hmm. um, like like the people around them. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is a, a pivotal time in a young man's life where he's being taken to a completely new place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they're also trying to stand on their own and mm-hmm. figure out who they are as a person. Right. So here we have like... Being isolated from their homeland, um, taken away from their family and friends, this would have been like an extremely traumatic event for them. This could open up a whole different type of vulnerability that never would have been them have been there and um, make them more open to like new ideas and increasing like the risk of them abandoning their faith and leaning towards Babylon's worldview. Yeah. Like this is stripping them away from everything that they would have known and placing them in a place where it's like, oh, man, I just want to push the red button. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, this is a, an interesting thing that's happening here where they're taking – and if, it's very specific, the people and the types of people that are being brought to Babylon. Mm-hmm. And it's not just any of the young men. It's not just, hey, bring over some young men so they can come and, 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 and help or do this or do that. It was the the natural leaders, the ones right. who were from royal family, who were from nobility. Um, they'd already probably demonstrated some like intellectual um, advancement. And they wanted to, and what King Nebi wanted to do hey. was to re-educate and uh, almost do this reprogramming mm-hmm. of who they were as believers as and in their past and just completely shift um, the things they already knew and, and turn them into something else. And it does two things. One, 
it's going to absolutely increase Babylon mm -hmm. in, 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 like they have these powerful people, um, these smart intellectual people who are coming over and learning their ways yeah. and going to work for Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. going to be his right hand men, going to do the things, his bidding. And then also because of that, he's pulling them away from Judah. Mm -hmm. So it's decreasing Judah at the same time, taking their young men who are going to be the leaders, who are going to be the noble people, who are going to be the ones who are probably future rulers mm -hmm. um, and taking them away from there and bringing them to him. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. And I think it's one of those things where when you look at it, it seems like maybe just a random thing that was done, but it's very, very... Purposeful. Um, yes. There's a reason behind what's happening here. Yeah, it is definitely for Babylon's like political, mm -hmm. you know, to help in the propaganda and all of that to grow Babylon yep. in a way. And I mean, they're taking youth without blemish, good in appearance, skilled in wisdom, um, and they're they're very intelligent yep. young men that they're taking. And so for a Jewish man to be taken from his family, one, like to have children is a big deal for a Jewish man back in that time. Um, and so from like, it does not hint anywhere in here in scripture. It does not say that um, Daniel was, you know, castrated or couldn't have any more children right. or anything like that. But we can assume that because that's something that they would have done to slaves is mm -hmm. so that they could not have children. Right. Um, and we do see that Daniel was never married. Um, so that's another big thing. It's like he's making it where these intelligent men cannot reproduce yeah and have more children um so that's another strike at judah yeah um so i thought man oof, that's that's crazy no it is it's very crazy i think of um and i i can't think of like a specific group or family or anything from like the united states but just if you thought of like like the valedictorians like they take all of the smartest right and the 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 people who are going to go to you know either d1 athletes or maybe even think like they're going to go to harvard and mm -hmm. like all of those who got accepted in there and they take them away and say nope that's not for you guys anymore um they're coming to us and that would be in the long run would be dehabilitating to mm -hmm. a nation mm -hmm. yeah i've been watching young sheldon lately <laughs> <laughs> so i'm thinking of like the sheldon's being that's taken. about to end did you know that? I, I think there's only one season left. Whoa. I've never seen it, but it's the talk of the town. Is it really? I don't know. I don't know. It's just on <laughs> Netflix, and so I wanted something funny. Young Sheldon. It kind of makes me chuckle. Anywho, <laughs> back in Yeah, it would be like if they just took Young Sheldon and- yeah. I mean, for real. He was yeah. a really smart little child. Yeah, he's also not real. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> ruined my dream. <laughs> Um, so the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So Chaldea is mentioned as a tribe in control of Babylonia, um, and it's another name for Babylon. However, it soon became like a word for magician or divinaire. Um, mm -hmm. So since the culture was so closely associated with this practice, Chaldean became this like, oh, they are a magician or they are practicing right. of some sort. Yeah. And that would have been some of the education they were receiving, right? So yeah. astrology, divination, other arts. Um, they wanted them to be, man, pros mm -hmm. in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have like moving forward a little bit more. The Babylons, like they aim to change the Hebrews lifestyle, encouraging them to eat and drink as the Babylonians do to win them over. And so after the three years, they would stand and face um, the king for like a final examination. Yeah. And in this, like, man, if you're living this lifestyle where you get to eat and drink and do whatever you basically want to do, most, like I want to say, like not being strong and rooted in the faith of God, like would tend to be like, man, yeah, why wouldn't yeah. I want to do these things? Absolutely. It's yeah. freeing or to them it looks freeing. Yeah. And I mean, just the temptation of it. Um, mm -hmm. You are away from your people. You're away from the people who would hold you accountable. Um, you're alone. They're young. Mm -hmm. And they're being presented, I mean, good living conditions, good mm -hmm. food, social prestige in exchange for loyalty to the king. Um, 
it would be pretty hard for most people to say, I'm not going to participate in that. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, even just the idea of like the culture of that time to have the same food and wine that was prepared for the king or the same stuff that he was going to have. I mean, mm-hmm. that's like an honor. That's a special, special honor. So it wasn't like they took these people from Judah and were treating them poorly. I mean, they were like saying, hey, we're going to treat you like the best of the best. Mm-hmm. All you have to do, study our stuff and then be loyal to the king. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, that would have been a tough, tough place to be in to say no to. Right. I'm like thinking too, I'm like, there's so much within today, like not to the extreme of what's going on with these boys, mm-hmm. but in today's culture, there are things that we have to deny ourselves as yeah. like from as believers. Absolutely. And anyways, do you, oh, the names. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that my computer is just spazzing, I apologize. No. No, it's it's typing random things. It's moving <laughs> randomly. It scrolls up and down. So whatever. I'm just going to go off the top and no notes. Um, <laughs> but but Daniel um, and his friends, so they have their the Hebrew boys. names. Yeah, the boys. Sorry. Uh, yep. And now it's, yeah, I don't know what my computer is doing at all. I just pulled up something random again. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm just going to shut it off, I guess. Do you want me to talk uh, about Daniel and the voice? No, I know what I need to say. It's just, it's actually just distracting and annoying <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> uh, but so Daniel and his friends, the boys, whatever you want to call them, they have their Hebrew names and Hebrew names all have like really special significance. Um, and I think that that is, it's something that, so like Daniel meant God is my judge. Hananiah meant Yahweh has been gracious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't remember the other two, I think. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But they all had like biblical meaning and it had to do something with like the greatness of God. Mm -hmm. And these names were then changed. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like the last straw of you are no longer who you who you were. Yeah. Um, You're you are who we're going to make you. And they named them after, I mean, like Babylonian gods Mm -hmm. um, completely like in the face of of what their names were in the past. And one of the things that popped into my head as I was reading this and just the significance of names is, and this isn't like a direct parallel, but I just thought it was cool. Like when Jesus changed somebody's name, it was always good. Mm. And then here, when their names are changed, it's demeaning. Mm -hmm. Um, And just like the special thing of like, just because it's a name change doesn't mean it's bad. Right. But when God does it, man, he's doing it for his glory. And whenever the Babylonians are doing it, it is completely like just defacing who they are as believers. Wow. I didn't think of that early, like whenever we were studying this before, like we do see in scripture where God changes the name of his followers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Abraham. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to go on all of that, but I didn't think of that. It's good. All right. I'm going to read because your computer's wigging out over there. I'm going to do verses eight through 10. Does that work for you? Yep. Okay. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion inside of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are in your of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. So right there we have um, that food that they're going to be given. And so there's an ask from Daniel of, hey, don't, I don't want to defile myself. So you see that twice in there. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel's decided he doesn't want to defile himself. And he's going to ask like, hey, please don't let me defile myself by eating this food. So then that, presents the question, what about this food would Mm -hmm. defile him? And we can only assume, Mm -hmm. um, we don't know for sure. I mean, you can see from food laws and that kind of thing, um, what could possibly be the reason why. Um, And I think that a good good explanation could be that the food was probably sacrificed to idols and it was unclean food. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, he would have been made ritually impure. But not only that, like it just would have been like 
throwing it in the face of God. Mm-hmm. Of like, I don't need to listen to you. Um, I know you've given me these rules and these laws, but I'm not going to listen to that because I'm here now. Um, so Daniel's showing just an extreme amount of like very careful with mm-hmm. the decisions that he's making that he doesn't want to defile himself and he doesn't want to diso- disobey God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like the big point of pulling this out. Like we don't know the why, right. but we know that he's saying to not allow it to defile him. Yep. So we know it's something really big. Um, and so we see Daniel stand up and shared his faith and convictions with the chief eunuch. And we can see here a little that it kind of moves him a little bit when it, with his response of like, I fear the king who who has assigned your food, like worse that he'd like basically lose his head mm-hmm. if he was to allow this to happen. Um, but Daniel stands his ground with grace and humility. And we don't see him being rude or arrogant yeah. about it. He's like coming to him like, please don't let this happen. Yeah. Because it will defile me. Right. And I think that's cool too. Just the, like the, the fact that he, it calls out why. Mm -hmm. It's not like he was beating around the bush and like, like, hey, I don't want to eat that. Like he was very straightforward. Like, hey, here's why. Please don't Mm -hmm. let me do this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is, this is kind of a crazy thing for him to ask because rejecting that food was rejecting the king and he doesn't know what's going to happen after that. I mean, you have the threat of potential punishment. I mean, they very well could have looked at somebody else and been like, what? Like, mm-hmm. okay, fine. If you don't want to eat the food, then you can go die. Right. Like it's either eat, do what we say or die. And he didn't know if that was going to be the outcome. And I just think that it, it should, as a 14 year old boy mm-hmm. who's alone, <laughs> who's being told, Hey, here's what you need to do. And he says, no, that's not that's not right. This Mm -hmm. is not, this is not right. This is not what God has told me to do. And then goes and just very, very carefully says, Hey, please don't let this, please don't let me do this. Right. Like Daniel and his, the boys are, there's not just four that have been captured. This was a, they were taken in two waves, right? Yeah. I can't remember the number that. I think the first one was 3000 and the second one was like 800. Yeah. 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 And so there's a lot Yep. of boys here. And one of the things that kind of struck me is, you know, when you say yes to one person, then you have to say yes to all people. Right, right. And so like even him to be able to say, yeah, that's fine. We'll go ahead and change your food laws, like f- change your food. Then who's to stop the next one or the next right. one or the next one. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of like when you say no to one person, because you don't want to have to say yes, yes to everybody right. else. Yep. Um, And we see in verse nine that, again, you know, God gave Daniel favor Mm -hmm. and compassion. Um, This was not anybody else's doing, but God did it himself. Yep. Just another example of that sovereignty of what Mm -hmm. God was doing and the way he was moving in all of this. Like even the (laughs) the ability to ask this question and for it to be received as well as it was, even Mm -hmm. though the first guy is like, I don't I don't really have control over this. Like, I'm going to get killed for this. Mm-hmm. Um, it still wasn't taken in a negative way. Um, I think that's just another example of, man, God God was moving in this. Yeah. I know we're going to get into this in a minute, um, but like, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and read verse. Do you want to read or is it your computer? I think I'm good now. Okay. Verse 11 through 16. Yep. Then Daniel said to the steward from the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them Vegetables. 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 Um, so like kind of, I don't know how I missed it while I was studying, but I was like, oh, the chief eunuch did this. I don't know how I missed the steward. Right. I was like, oh, these are two different people yep. here that are in play. Like it's not just the chief eunuch was like, okay, I'm going to do all of this. It was like, no, Daniel then went to a steward Yep. and he was the one who tested him for 10 days and that... 10 days um, isn't necessarily uh, like a literal. It could be symbolic because mm. we do see testing for 10 days throughout scripture. Right, right, right. 
Um, so I thought that was kind of neat. And kind of going back to, I think, defile, sorry, but defile there can mean like pollute, stain, or desecrate. Mm. So it's not something that's just like kind of backhanded. It's a pretty big yes for him. Okay. Yep. And that, uh, I think vegetables is interesting. Like a lot of people just think, oh, like a couple things. Like we all think of vegetables and we think of certain things, maybe, you know, whatever it could Corn. be. I don't know vegetables because I don't like vegetables. So I love vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Lima um, beans. I don't know why people like them. I eat grass. That's not really cool to me, but whatever. You don't uh, like salad? With like dressing and bacon and chicken and cheese and <laughs> all the good stuff on top. Blue cheese. Yeah. I do like blue cheese. I know. Uh, I guess I can't really talk crap about uh, vegetables if I will eat old Jeez, that's been, yeah, whatever. Moving on. Um, so vegetables, it can refer to more than just like what we would think of mm-hmm. today as vegetables. It was just grains and plants, so not strictly just the green bean, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And I don't know how true this is because I didn't look through every single thing, so I'm just going to say it. And oh, okay, good. if good. anyone um, thinks I'm wrong, you can email in and Stephanie gave me this information. So oh, well. the... <laughs> One of the things that was why maybe he said vegetables. So he has the first ask where he's like, he didn't, he didn't say anything. He did not say like substitute the food. He just said, Hey, don't let me defile myself. Mm -hmm. And the guy tells him, I can't, like, I don't know what you want me to do. You know, it's my head or not. And then the second one, he, he kind of compromises a little bit and says, Hey, so maybe just vegetables and water then like Mm -hmm. we won't not eat, but just give us this. And one of the things I saw was that Mosaic Law never designated any kind of vegetables as unclean. So there may have been like this thing in Daniel who was like, okay, fine, we will eat, but I'm not going to take a chance of eating something that could defile me. Um, So yeah, Daniel could eat any of the vegetables put before him without defiling himself. That sounds pretty... Yeah. I feel like I could believe you on that. Yeah. I mean, I did a little bit of research on it um, of like reading through the different food laws and I didn't see anything about vegetables, but yeah, mm. this was one of the commentaries said that and I just wanted to try and back it up, but I didn't have enough time to like really knock it out. No, I like it. Yeah. It was good. So they were fattier in flesh, fatter, not fattier. Is fattier. it fatter or fattier? I think it's just fatter. It just says fatter yeah. in the flesh. Yeah. So Parker Robbins yesterday kind of went a little, got a little excited Yeah, about this. A a little. He was like, one cup of peas is equal to eight grams of protein. And then he was like looking into like, peas can give you so much protein. And then what was the other one? Soy. Soybeans. Yes. And then he spent like 20 minutes over there being super quiet. And it was because he was looking up all of the protein. And he's like, and it's really cool because... This is where it started is around these areas. Yeah. He says, he says, I didn't do the research. I didn't so I'm do just going to trust Parker. We're just going to trust Parker yeah, on this. That, uh, Parker Robbins. Yes, Parker Robbins. That uh, peas and soybeans would have like originated in this general area where Be- Babylon would have been. Uh-huh. So if he's right, that's really cool. I mean, are you going to eat like eight cups of peas today? No, I won't eat one pea today. Why? And so much protein. They're, they're I gross. know you just said vegetables. I like gross. some vegetables. I'm going to take it back. Um, okay, good. I felt like a liar after wow. I said I don't like any vegetables. I'm glad um, you And are I'm on record. Repenting. Yeah. On. I'm going to repent, conf- confess. But uh, <laughs> I do like some, but like, that's gross. Peas, mushy. Gross. I love peas. Yeah, no. Oh, gosh. I love vegetables. Whatever. You guys? Peas? No? Oh, my goodness. Someone? Okay. Yeah, no, they are shaking their heads vigorously. No, it's the worst vegetable they've ever heard of. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in, just like we see Daniel and his friends, um, they had honored God. And now God is honoring them by giving them favor with the guard and their bodies. Right. Yes. Um, it's pretty cool to see here. Like there's there's two things working here. And I don't want to go on like a, a vegan kick here. but. Hey. Uh, Let's do it. Michael did get excited about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But like they are actually like they look better. Like Mm -hmm. they're healthy because of what they're doing, what they're eating. Um, This wasn't a case of um, 
like it's like they ate something different, like some kind of different meat. Like this is vegetables only. Right. Um, drinking water, drinking vegetables. And it says that they looked better. They were fatter, which just refers to looking healthier. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's something to be said about this diet and the way that it affects the body. And, and maybe it's the right way to do it. Listen, we've had this conversation before. I'm pretty sure we have. Yeah, that yeah, we yeah. were probably meant to be vegetarians. Yeah, probably. Because of our teeth. They're not all pointy like carnivores. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I've don't. i never done a lot of research behind it because Listen, I don't want to be proven wrong. I just want to, yeah. Uh, back ones? What are you guys doing? Me and Parker, <laughs> me and Parker neighbor like pointing at our teeth yeah. like, which one is it? Do you think? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> which tooth is the? <laughs> which one do you think? It's just like that. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. That was no, very we carnivorous like, of you. Thank you. <laughs> I do love like hamburgers and steak. Yeah. And that's all what of I was that. saying. I that, do enjoy it. Yeah. But before the fall, like no animals, no blood would have been shed. Yeah. So they would have just been eating fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And if that's right. And that's the best way to do it. I don't want to know because I love steak. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Is it? Is it? Is, is, is it? <laughs> is it? Verse 17 through 21. Did I read last or you? I did. Okay, my turn. I, oh, wait. Did you have anything else for that little section? Um, I think the only thing, and I was just going to throw it in because it can go with both. It doesn't really matter. But... One of the cool things that the commentary pulled out that I was reading, and this was just, I thought was awesome, was this isn't Daniel flippantly testing God to see if he would sustain them. Mm. So this isn't a a fact or a matter of Daniel going, okay, God, um, let's see if this works or not. And if you really love me, um, if you really care about me and you really have favor on me, then you'll sustain me through this. This was like the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. This was him faithfully and obediently serving God and trusting him to sustain, to sustain them, which is two totally different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that even us today, we can get trapped in of like, okay, God, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to follow what you said. So you better, right. you better. Hold up your end yes, of the deal. Exactly. But what we see here is that when you obediently follow God, he does hold up mm-hmm. his side of it. So it's not a test. This is, we should go into it with this trusting and this faith that he's going to take care of us. Mm-hmm. And we see that later on in Daniel with the Absolutely. boys. Yep. Whenever the boys were like, our God will save us, but even if he doesn't, mm. we will not bow. Yes. Yep. So it's definitely in line with their character. Uh-huh. Of they were very faithful and obedient. And even if it didn't happen, that was okay. Right. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, and so, oh, and then I guess I do have one more thing. So the steward took away their food and the the wine that they were to drink and to give them vegetables. This is talking about Daniel and the boys. It's mm. not talking about all of the boys that were in. Right. We kind of did a little bit of research on that, um, and that was kind of the things. Yeah, the word there in 16 is just playing off of the they, which is also just coming from... Uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Mm-hmm. So if you follow what it's, um, I see the words leaving me right now, but regardless, it's not talking about all of them. Right. So they didn't change the diet for all, all 3,000 yes. boys that were there. It was just for those four. Mm-hmm. Okay, verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among of all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians and enchanters that were in all of the kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Boom. Well done. That was, my heart was pounding. <laughs> and so again, we see God gave in 17. Mm-hmm. So their success was a gift from God. The mm-hmm. fact that they were able to um, learn what they did and the the skill that they had obtained, the the wisdom was all from God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's definitely something that was set apart. 
Um, and we see Daniel had, uh, this sets him up for the rest of yes. his time in Babylon, where he has an understanding in all visions and dreams. Yes. So you have a, they all received this learning and skill mm -hmm. in the, in literature and wisdom. But then Daniel has a unique gift that's mm -hmm. given to him by God that sets him apart even further because of the help that he's going to need to provide to Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool to see that um, God was setting him up mm -hmm. for that role. Yeah, that is. Um, at the end of the time, this was three years. So this was after, you know, this is them standing before King Neb to be right. judged over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to see if they pass the test. Yeah, I'm like, yep. what kind of qu questions like was being asked here? Right. What color is the sky today? Yeah. Yeah. Was he asking them uh, like softball questions right. and then uh, they were like, he's like, oh, cool. They passed. Or was this dude like super, super smart right. and was asking him some difficult questions Yeah, and they were blowing him away. Right. Yeah. These are things we don't know, right. but it's just fun to ask. Yeah. We don't know. All right. The last thing that, uh, well, not last thing. I have a couple things. I guess I shouldn't say last but I liked the point in verse 19 where it's Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're not called their Babylonian names right. here. We don't know why. I kind of compared it to whenever like Jacob and Israel. Like so when Jacob was walking in step with God, he was referred to as Israel. Mm -hmm. And then whenever he was kind of like walking out, he was called Jacob. Um, I don't know if that's why, right. but we see them doing these this thing of this courageous thing for three years. And so they are recognized as their Hebrew names here. I don't yeah. know if that's why, but right. that's my assumption. Yeah. Um, and verse 21, we have like the point here is not to provide the date of Daniel's death, but, and it's to be theological. It's not chronological. Daniel was not written so we can have like a history of what was going on. There's right. historical events in place. But this is to tell a story about God. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I don't really have anything else for those verses. Um, those last few, just the pointing out that God's sovereignty and all of it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's about all I had. Well, with the time marker, we if if Daniel was 14, um, he would have been in captivity for 67 years. So this would put him roughly around 81 years old. Wow. When he passed. Yeah. So 67 years of being away from your family. Yeah. Wow. And one of the other things we talked about in Exegesis that isn't with this text right here, but a lot of people, because we know that Daniel was so young at this part of the story, yeah. that we jump forward a few chapters and he's in the lion's den. Right. And everyone thinks he's still like a 14-year-old, which yeah. would have still been crazy. Oh, but yeah. But this is like at that time was like 80-year-old Daniel yeah. in the lion's den. You're talking an older dude in there. I mean, that's, yeah. So a lot of time passes in those first uh, six chapters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does. Well, we see, and another big point is like Daniel like went through a lot of kings. Yep. It wasn't just one. Right. I think there was like three or four. Yep. <laughs> and he made it through all of them in high standing. Yeah. And one of them ends up calling him by Daniel yep. instead of his Babylonian name. Yeah. I can't remember it. I did it as a note. Okay. Last thoughts. Closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Yeah. For me, whenever I was reading this and studying, I think the thing that really like stood out to me was, and you kind of mentioned it at the very beginning was that today, like we may not be facing the same mm -hmm. difficulty that they're facing here, but we're, we're throwing a lot of stuff that mm -hmm. wants us to try to conform to a different belief system. Yeah. Um, to, to, turn us away from the God that we believe in. And it's done in a subtle way, like even as subtle as like a food thing. Yeah. Like it's so small, like, Hey, just do, do you really need to do that one? Mm -hmm. Like, do you really need to follow that one? Um, and so much so that it's like, we're in a place where it's like, okay, well, I guess I can just eat the food, mm -hmm. you know, as the metaphor, I can just, I can just eat the food. Um, that's not that bad. Like, I can ask for forgiveness, right? But, and, and it just had me thinking that like, man, we have that in our face all the time. 
and we're not even in as difficult of a situation as they were. So it's inspiring yeah. to see Daniel and his friends like, man, they stood strong in their faith mm-hmm. and they were obedient, even though they were under fire and they were like being so much put under so much pressure to conform. Um, and maybe you feel that today, like in your life, like you feel the pressure to conform at a job, at um, in a friend group or wherever it might be. And I think you can look at this story and be like, okay, I can, I can do it. Mm-hmm. If, if those 14 year old boys in a foreign land with people all around them telling them, don't do this, do this, can stand strong. And then also you get to see God's faithfulness in that. I think it's, I mean, at least inspires me. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I'm just thinking on like how, you know, in today in our world, like to look different is totally not okay. Yeah. Like everybody wants us to, well, it's okay to do this or to do that Mm -hmm. and to be set apart is like almost the thing you shouldn't do. Right. Right. So yeah, it was really encouraging to me to read this story again. We've gone through this, um, multiple times on a fast look, like looking at it through a fasting perspective on why we should fast and to look at it through the guarding Mm. perspective of how we're supposed to put up guardrails in our lives um, because God is still good and he's still faithful through it all. Um, And the encouragement that I get that these are young men who are doing this and standing strong in their faith when they could easily have chose to turn away from their faith and eat the food and drink the drink and have a good old time, they chose to obey God. Yeah. When yeah. nobody else was looking at them, nobody else was going to tell their mom or their dad, right. they still chose to be obedient yeah. to the Lord. Yeah, that's good. That's all I got. Cool. Do you want to do the, you know, warehouse at cornerstone.team? I think you just did it. There it is. Yeah. So what she just said, uh, yeah, if you have any questions or concerns <laughs> or if we... We said something that you were like, ah, oh, I'm a little off or that's, that didn't sound right. That's okay. Um, email it in warehouse at cornerstone.team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you and we love encouragement. We love questions. Right. We love it all. So we do. yeah, send it our way. Think of a question for us to do at the very beginning. Yes. If you have, if you are someone who is really good at coming up with good questions. Give it to us, please. Just send it because yeah, we would appreciate I'm it. tired of Stephanie telling me to come up with one. Did you come up with today? I think Parker did. Yeah, because I don't want to anymore. I know. You normally don't. I sent you like six one time. Yeah, I didn't like it. Whatever. You should sing like Nathan did at the end of our last I'm not going to sing. Okay. No. Okay, fine. Well, then I guess the warehouse is done today. Adios. Adios.